My name is Madeline Dressner, and I'm excited to be here with you today to share about some of the engaging work I've been doing with my colleagues, the future upcoming mathematicians, scientists, researchers, and writers. Every day, we research. Every day, my colleagues and I analyze. We create theories. We revise theories. And every day, we take a break for snack at 10.30 AM. What do I do? I teach elementary school, and every day comes with the promise of a new adventure, and every day comes with the opportunity for, to ignite a student's passion in an area of interest for them. In the 21st century classroom, we're engaged in work that's academically rigorous. And in the 21st century classroom, we're engaged in that work through the use of literature and technology. The omnipresence of technology in our society is prevalent to even the youngest of students. As I look around my classroom, I notice students using iPads to communicate with each other, students collaborating on iPads, creating writing samples, editing, making videos, students using photos and videos to document their academic progress. I notice students programming robots using code to create a path for a robot to navigate. As I look around my room, I notice the many ways in which technology is used. My students know the far-reaching impact of technology. Technology helps to tie us together. As I look around my classroom, I wonder how technology can be used in really meaningful ways. How can we begin to shift the paradigm of what it means to use technology in our world today? How can we help to empower students and help to foster advocacy? How can we use technology, this tool that's all around us, to foster social justice in our students? What if we use technology in compassionate and innovative ways to create positive social change in our schools, communities, and the world? Let me share with you one way I found this out, and it seemed to be, just like every day is for me, another reminder that my students are my greatest teachers. It seemed that it happened one app at a time. Apps for a Cause started as a one-to-one -one iPad initiative um, in a classroom where I was student teaching during my graduate work at Adelphi University. Students had their own iPads, and they would come through the door of school every morning with a charged iPad, place it on their desk, ready to learn. And as I looked around at the charged iPads before me, I wondered, what can I do to make this technology come alive? How can I really make this a meaningful experience for my students in an academic context, but also to better their social and emotional health? How can I help them to develop as citizens? So the first thing we did was research. My students were engaged in iPad research, thinking about what is a cause. What does it mean? What is a local cause? What is a global cause? What do I represent as a citizen of the world? Students researched these local and global causes and collected information about what kinds of things these organizations do. Organizations like Feeding America, organizations like the World Wildlife Fund, organizations like the Ronald McDonald House of Long Island. Students researched these organizations to learn more about the power that people are creating, fostered together in our community. Students took diligent notes and were really engaged in this research to the point where they started to think, what can I do? And that's where we drew the connection to technology. Being that technology was all around us, I introduced to my students the ways in which applications are being used to help others. Having an application that helps to adjust prosthetics for an individual that uses prosthetics. An iPad application that helps doctors in third world countries to access information. Those kinds of ideas got my students thinking, what can we do? So our answer was this. We came up with ideas for applications that students would create, if they could, to help support their chosen cause. Students worked in classroom companies. They researched. Students emailed the organizations themselves. And they began to find that these companies were emailing them back. My students learned here a valuable lesson that I learned as well. Their voices had power. When my students got these emails back, they were so excited that they were able to engage as citizens, not just as children, but as real members who were participating in the community. 
They got these emails back and then created different ways to show their work. All of our work culminated in an app expo in which my students presented what they had created to the world. This was their opportunity to show how they would give back to the world. And they were so excited. As I looked around the App Expo that day, I noticed students who were shaking hands with adult representatives from organizations like Feeding America and like the Ronald McDonald House of Long Island. I noticed students who were showing on their iPad presentations they had created, students using public speaking skills. I noticed students, one in particular who I remember was using a rap that she created about hunger to communicate the importance of donating food and collecting food um, to support ending hunger. This, the part that really resonated with me was that this student, only six months prior, had come to the United States from another country and had just been learning to speak English. So to hear her speaking this rap about feeding America and about how to support hunger and what she could do, and to see her so empowered was only one of the experiences that I took away from app, the App Expo. As I looked around at my students, I noticed the compassion, I noticed their engagement, and I noticed their advocacy skills. And this, to me, was a big takeaway. I quickly realized how if we can give students and children the opportunity to express the power of their voice and empower children, they become charged as agents of change. This is where we begin to think about, how can we do this? We begin to draw the connection in a couple of ways. The ways I discovered that we could do this are through the use of advocacy, building citizenship in students, and the development of empathy. When we started this project, we talked about what does it mean to be an advocate? What kinds of things do advocates do? I talked about this with my third grade class this year. And I said, what does it mean to be an advocate? And I had a couple of hands raised, and I had a couple of students who had some great guesses, but weren't quite sure what an advocate was. When I went on to explain what exactly an advocate is, students formed meaningful connections. Students raised their hands and made connections to members in our school community who advocate, made connections to famous figures who advocate, like Martin Luther King Jr., for example. Students know what advocacy is. It's just bringing that conversation to light. And that's the first step of what we need to do, to have those meaningful conversations with students. When we have those conversations with students about what is advocacy and how can I be an advocate, then we can empower those students to shift their mindset. The way in which they view the world then becomes a way where they perceive themselves as being able to change and change others and to give back, and they can. They're ready. So I encourage you to have those conversations with students. What is an advocate? What does it mean? Arming them with an advocate's toolkit is the first step. Citizenship is a concept that has gone digital. The internet and technology has broadened the scope of the human experience. Within a second, students, children, adults, users of the internet are connected. Connected to people, connected to places, connected to ideas, connected to causes. They're connected to themselves. They're connected to the experiences that tie us together, the human experience. They're aware, aware of their privilege, aware of the privilege of others. Technology is the language that our children speak. And if we infuse our use of technology with an undercurrent for social change, we begin to shape the language. And we can shape that language into one that is fostered with care and compassion. So how do we begin to help students understand a concept as vast as citizenship? The first thing that we can do is to help them process information. Every day as citizens, as adults of the world, we're processing information from the news, from the radio, from the TV. All of the work we do every day, we expose children to this work. How do we interpret statistics? What do statistics mean? What does it mean when an article is biased or it's written from a certain perspective? How does the opinion in one person in one part of the world differ from that of another? All of these conversations that we do every day, that we have with each other, 
we include children. They're ready. Their natural curiosity partnered with their ability to be technological savvy and their interest in technology makes them natural advocates. How do we develop empathy? Well, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's our responsibility, yours and mine, to help students develop empathy. So I think about, well, how can I do this? And this is something I think about in my classroom every day. This is something, the character of my students when they leave my classroom is something that I care very deeply about. So how can we help children to develop empathy? We can try to help expose them to some of the issues in the world. We can arm them with an advocate's toolkit. We can put the world at their fingertips one mouse click away or one keyboard button away. What we can't do is make them care. We can't force them to care. We can't make advocacy a test grade, a homework assignment, or an assessment. But what we can do is inspire. Energy is infectious. Energy is the reason I'll find myself bouncing around my classroom, singing about a congruent conga line as my students bounce along. Energy is also inspirational. I'm not sure if my congruent conga line has inspired any budding mathematicians to pursue a deep study of shape congruence, but energy that is infectious ignites a passion, if not in congruence, in some other area. Energy as a scientific principle cannot be created nor destroyed. It's our job to create it. Create empathic energy. If you model it yourself, children, others, begin to care. That's how we help students learn to care. We inspire them. As I conclude, I just want to share with you some of the different examples of the takeaways that my students had from the project. But also, really, the takeaways I had myself in regards to advocacy, citizenship, and empathy were ones that will stay with me forever and impact who I am and how I teach. If we, in just an hour, were able to expose children to the impact of technology from the perspective of a positive social change and help them to see technology as a tool to foster advocacy, we would be able to create a youth network characterized by social responsibility and global citizenship. Frequently in education, a lot of conversation is, what does it mean to be a digital citizen? in an online community. Citizenship is a concept that's gone digital. How do students transfer their citizenship to the online world? How do students understand that their digital footprint carries with them for the rest of their life? Having these conversations with students about how to process information, how to evaluate, and how to analyze information is where we start. They're ready to be involved in the conversation, and they're excited. The three things, the three takeaways that I want to leave you with are this. Advocacy. Engage students in those conversations. Give students the tools that they need to be advocates. Citizenship. Expose students to and help them analyze and process information. And finally, empathy. Empower students with your empathic energy. Inspire them to care. Thank you.